Let us prepare our hearts with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, draw near to us once more. As you've claimed us and called us, also renew us and remake us, that we may be your children, your vessels, those that love as you have first loved us. Be with us now, in the name of Christ. Amen. So looking at this broad theme of love, hearing passages from the Old Testament of David and Jonathan, knowing of commitments we make to one and another, I've chosen a passage from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, where Jesus speaks about love, but he does speak about it in a challenging way. So listen to Christ's words and these scriptures for today. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, who makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your sisters and brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't the Gentiles do the same? So be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love the fact that the interval of a perfect fourth can be identified by such commonly known songs as O Tannenbaum and Amazing Grace and the Bridal Chorus from Wagner's opera Lohengrin. The first song reminds us of Christmas time, of gathering to decorate trees and to tell again of Christ's birth in a manger long ago. The second song, Amazing Grace, provides almost instant comfort. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We sing that song when we're troubled, when we're grieving the death of a loved one, when we want to be reminded that we're not alone. But then comes the third option, Wagner's Bridal Chorus. It's been sung as Here Comes the Bride by countless children who've done mock weddings in school playgrounds. It was featured in the classic Looney Tunes cartoon When Bugs Bunny Married Elmer Fudd. It's a melody that we associate with weddings and marriages even to this day. And it opens with that perfect fourth. Perfect. Perfect is both a noun and a verb. Something perfect is without flaw or blemish. To perfect something is to improve it, to move it from a lesser state to something ideal. But the word perfect is also an adjective, as in, it is a perfect day, or in a football game, he threw a perfect pass. Or in the words of Jesus we just heard, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now perfect as a noun, we understand. Perfect as a verb is fairly clear. But perfect as an adjective, especially as an adjective that might be applied to us, that's a little more troubling to consider. Only an absolute narcissist would look in the mirror and think, I'm utterly perfect. We all have flaws. We all make mistakes. Paul famously wrote, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And last week we heard Jesus say to the rich young man, why do you call me good? There is none that is good except God alone. So is perfection something that we actually attain or is perfection only something to which we strive? I would say the answer is actually both, but that type of a double answer is going to need some explaining. 
Saint Dimitri of Rostov was a 17th century saint recognized in the Orthodox Church. A long time ago, someone wrote to Saint Dimitri and asked him, how do I pray properly? To which he gave this reply. He said, never go back and repeat your prayers done poorly. It's far better to put ourselves at the mercy of God and simply try to do better next time. This method will reduce the possibility of thinking that God hears our prayers according to the perfection of our praying and not according to the greatness of God's mercy. Now actually that's very wise advice. If you pray poorly, if you stumble over the words, if you get mixed up in your train of thought, well, notice that fact and, and maybe strive to do better the next time. But remember, it's not about you. It's always about the one that's listening to you, the one who's caring for you as you pray. And that one, that one is perfect. Perfect in being, perfect in love, perfect in intent which shifts us to kind of the next point. Perfection is not really a quality that we possess, but it's something better located in the relationship between two persons. Today, as part of our worship service, we're going to be recognizing couples from our church who got married during this crazy pandemic season. Now, the list of couples who got married since... 2020 actually isn't very long because quite a few weddings had to be canceled or at least significantly postponed due to COVID. But some people did get married, although I'm not sure if any of them used Here Comes the Bride in their service. But actually, that's another place where we stumble onto this word perfect because sometimes people will say, oh, they have the perfect marriage. Now, every couple is familiar with the tension between the ideal of a perfect marriage and the reality of their relationship, which invariably is going to be less than perfect. All of us have good days and bad days. There are times in every relationship of intimacy, and there are times of disagreement. Successful couples learn to navigate these ups and downs. That is what makes a successful marriage, even if it's not officially a perfect marriage. So again, there's a, a pattern emerging here. Perfection is never an individual quality. It's something that emerges in a relationship between two people, like partners striving for a perfect marriage, or in our relationship with God, offering our flawed prayers to God who hears us and loves us and intercedes for us perfectly. If our goal is perfection, then it's something that will always need more than just us alone. Another story. People have been trying to set records for the mile race going back to the 1850s. For the longest time, the primary barrier that people tried to break was the four-minute mile, which was broken famously by Roger Bannister in 1954. It was a marvelous achievement. It was almost sheer perfection for its day. But Bannister did not break the barrier by himself. Roger Bannister was studying medicine in England at the time and only trained as a runner on the side. He knew he was fast, but in order to try and break a record like the four-minute mile, he would have to be paced by faster runners who were adept at running shorter distances. So in this case, he needed help from Chris Brasher, the 3,000-meter expert, and Chris Chataway, the 5,000 meter expert. On May the 6th, 1954, the trio gathered as a race was being held in the city of Oxford. Bannister decided that on that day, the conditions were right to try and break the record. And so as the race started, Brasher took off and led the field, including Bannister, through a 57 second first quarter. 
At the halfway point of the race, Chataway took over, and he led Bannister and the rest of the runners to a three-quarter pace of just around three minutes flat. During the backstretch, then, Bannister swept past Chataway and himself accelerated until he broke the tape with a time of three minutes and 59 seconds before literally collapsing into the arms of the track officials. It was an amazing accomplishment, but it would have been impossible if Bannister had worked alone. He could never have reached that level of perfection. If we're going to hear Jesus' words about perfection, before we're tempted to measure ourselves, it's important for us to close our eyes and to think about other relationships in our life. And as we do that, it's right to be guided by other words of Scripture, words like Galatians 2.20, where it says, It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells within you? And Philippians 3.12, not that I've already obtained this or that I've already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Christ has made us his own. Christ dwells in us. God's spirit lives in us. Jesus Christ invites us into that type of relationship I've described it's one in which we are like branches grafted onto a strong vine, vessels filled to overflowing with God's spirit of love and justice and grace. Jesus calls us to be holy. Jesus calls us to be perfect, never expecting that those qualities are attainable on our own. Rather, it's part of what it means to be children of God, to be those whose parent is in heaven. It involves then turning the other cheek. It involves then giving to those in need. It involves loving even our enemies, of being salt, of being light, of being witnesses to God's perfection, even as it shines perhaps dimly through our own being. But that's God's design. That's Christ's intent because he calls us to be perfect and he provides the indwelling grace of his perfection. As I mentioned, perfect fourths are funny intervals. Unlike every other interval, you can't make a perfect fourth, major or minor, by shifting around the top note by a half step. If you add or subtract from a perfect fourth, it becomes something else entirely. And that's part of what makes it perfect. We too are called to live out our lives as if we were a perfect fourth, to be consistent, as consistent as we can in our thoughts and deeds, opening ourselves to the indwelling of Christ and God's love, moving beyond what the world considers right and in tune and righteous to exhibit a perfection not of our own making or even our own choosing, but a righteousness given to us by God in Christ. It is a perfection then that is made real in love, a loving perfection, as it were. So may we love as perfectly as we can by God's grace. And by doing so, may we fully become the children of our heavenly father and mother. And by that, may we honor Christ's command this day and always. Amen.